Welcome, everyone. I am Joan Sorensen, Brown class of 1972. I am married to a Brown grad who holds the record, I think, for having spent the longest time at Brown. Nine years getting four degrees, till I threatened to leave him if he did not leave Brown. Our two children, twins, graduated from Brown in 2006, and three of my four sisters went to Brown, and they married Brown men. So I have lots of Brown connections in my family, more than I care to count. I am delighted to be attending this wonderful conference with so many successful and talented fellow alumni. I hope you all thought the morning sessions were informative and engaging, and some were actually entertaining. I hope now you are ready to hear about the group service project that we have planned for 6 p.m. this evening. Please continue to enjoy your lunch as I introduce the speakers. Dr. Tara Shirazian, who received her undergraduate degree from Brown, is a 1999 graduate, and she also received her medical degree from the Brown Medical School in 2003. Dr. Shirazian is a gynecologic surgeon and an assistant professor at NYU Langone Medical Center in New York City. She is also the co-founder President and Medical Director of Saving Mothers, which is a nonprofit 501c3 organization dedicated to preventing maternal deaths and birth related complications in the developing world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shirazi. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here today. What a fantastic conference. It's really been amazing to see all these wonderful speakers and to attend the conference. And I am, I am lucky and feel very lucky to be part of the WLC, which brought you um, this conference. And um, I'm very, very humbled that they invited me to speak and to do this community service project today. So I want to say a big thank you to them um, for allowing this community service project to happen. So this afternoon, we will be making 600 safe birth kits. These safe kits are very simple kits with very simple devices. Everyone will see when they, when they come to the event. I hope you will all attend. Um, and also includes simple instructions on how to perform a clean, safe delivery and when to refer appropriately. I can tell you, since I run the organization and serve as the medical director, that these 600 safe birth kits will be traveling to Kapanguria Hospital, Kenya, West Pokot region of Kenya, and will be given to women in labor, at pregnancy, at home, or in the hospitals, and will be basically hand delivered by our organization to them as we always do. So I will give great follow up to the kits as well. You'll be able to see them in action and it will essentially be you putting your hands on kits here in Providence, Rhode Island and them arriving to West Pukut, Kenya and saving the lives of women in West Pukut, Kenya. So I can't. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to spend the afternoon, and I hope you'll all agree. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Tara. This is a very impactful and crucial project, and one that I hope we will all participate in tonight at 6 p.m. in Sales Hall. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Brown's 19th president, Christina Paxson. Yesterday, I attended the Rhode Island Innovation Policy Lab's Women in Leadership Conference. Emily Oster, who is in the economics department at Brown, was one of the many new outstanding professors that Chris has been able to convince to join the faculty at Brown. Emily had the pleasure of introducing Chris. She gave a very brief introduction to which Chris responded, thanks Emily for not reading my entire bio. <laughs> so I am doing the same in hopes of getting a thanks Joan for not reading my entire bio. 
I have volunteered at Brown since I graduated in 1972. And one of the most important things that I have done over the past 45 years at Brown was to serve on the Presidential Search Committee. We had lots of superb candidates, but as you all know, we selected the best. President Paxson is a distinguished scholar in the field of economics and public policy. She is so distinguished that she was recently elected to the Academy of Arts and Sciences. So please join me in congratulating Chris on this very prestigious honor. Chris is also an effective administrator who understands what it takes to sustain a world-class institution like Brown. In her almost five years at Brown, she has crafted a strategic plan that now is the basis of the Brown Together campaign of which my husband and I are co-chairs. This plan builds upon our strengths and helps Brown become a leader in important areas that impact society and the world. She is also dedicated to adapting Brown's academic programs in a way that both preserves the university's traditions and meets the changing needs of today's students. As this work has progressed, she has put emphasis on experiential learning, building a diverse faculty, staff, and student body, crafting the DAP, which is the Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan, and leveraging partnerships with the City of Providence and the State of Rhode Island in order to better serve the communities surrounding our campus. We are fortunate to have an educator and administrator of her caliber leading this institution at such a critical juncture in its history. Please join me in welcoming President Christina Paxson. Uh, thank you so much, Joan, for not reading my entire bio. Uh, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first special luncheon of the 125 Years of Women at Brown Conference. So as generations of alumni gather on College Hill to celebrate the contributions that women, men, all of you, have made to Brown University, it is truly my honor and privilege to introduce the Chair of the Federal Reserve, a distinguished member of the class of 1967. I thought there were some more of those out there, yeah? And the first woman to lead the Central Bank of the United States, Dr. Janet Yellen. Now, I will not read her full bio, but I just wanted to make a few remarks, which is she really epitomizes what many, many Brown students do. They come in thinking that they're going to do one thing, and then they do something else. Uh, and she started as a philosophy concentrator and then had the great good sense, inspired by some of our wonderful faculty members, to go into the field of economics. Uh, she went from there to get a PhD at Yale to a spectacular academic career. And for a lot of people, that would have been enough. Uh, they would have retired emeritus professor and that, that you know, wonderful. But I, I think Janet had, Dr. Yellen has been spectacular in, in understanding how economics has such an impact on people's lives. And going into public service in her field, she could really take the, take the uh, research that she knows so well and apply it to things that would improve uh, human well-being. Uh, her call to service came in 1994 when she joined the Fed Board of Governors, uh, leading to a stint advising President Bill Clinton as the head of the Council of Economic Advisors before becoming President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And then in 2014, when the Senate confirmed her as President Barack Obama's choice to become chair of the Fed, she rose to what her professors at Brown had intimated so many years ago, that a person whose every comment or gesture is scrutinized by analysts around the world 
for hints of economic vitality and consumer confidence, she became the public face of the Federal Reserve. Now, I'm going to add one more thing before I close. Uh, no introduction of somebody as prominent as Janet Yellen is complete without one pop culture superlative. And I couldn't resist this one because we know at Brown that we don't care about rankings, right? <laughs> but I will note that Dr. Janet Yellen ranked number six on the 2016 Forbes list of the world's most powerful people just behind Pope Francis. <laughs> and just ahead of Bill Gates. So on behalf of everyone at Brown, a place where um, so much of it began for you, we're thrilled to join, have you join us here. So join me in welcoming Dr. Janet Yellen. Thank you so much, Christina, for that wonderful introduction, and um, thanks so much to all of you here for the warm welcome. I want to say one, what an honor it is as an alumna of this great university to be here today and part of this important occasion. As we celebrate the 125th anniversary of women being admitted to Brown, it seems appropriate to reflect on the progress that women have achieved in the intervening years. Since 1891, women have made tremendous strides in their ability to pursue their dreams of education and meaningful work and to support themselves and their families. In pursuing these goals, women have helped improve working conditions for all workers and have been a major factor in America's prosperity over the past century and a quarter. Despite this progress, evidence suggests that many women remain unable to achieve their goals. The gap in earnings between women and men, although smaller than it was years ago, is still significant. Women continue to be underrepresented in certain industries and occupations, and too many women struggle to combine aspirations for work and family. Further advancement has been hampered by barriers to equal opportunity and workplace rules and norms that fail to support a reasonable work-life balance. If these obstacles persist, we will squander the potential of many of our citizens and incur a substantial loss to the productive capacity of our economy at a time when the aging of the population and weak productivity growth are already weighing on economic growth. To enliven the history I will present today, I will include the experiences of women graduates of this institution, in most cases in their own words, as related in oral histories preserved by Brown. Among these alumni, I'm proud to say, is a member of my own family, who is an early graduate of Pembroke, Elizabeth Stafford Hirschfelder of the class of 1923. Her career and achievements as a mathematician embody both the opportunities that opened for Pembroke graduates in the decades after she left here and the limitations many women faced and the compromises she, like so many others, was forced to make. From the time that Brown began to accept women and into the 1920s, most women in the United States did not work outside the home and those who did were primarily young and unmarried. In that era, just 20% of all women were gainful workers, as the Census Bureau then categorized labor force participation outside the home. And only 5% of those, of those married were categorized as such. Of course, these statistics somewhat understate the contributions of married women to the economy 
beyond housekeeping and child rearing, since women's work in the home often included work in family businesses and the home production of goods, such as agricultural products for sale. Also, the aggregate statistics obscure the differential experience of women by race. African American women were about twice as likely to participate in the labor force as were white women at the time, largely because they were more likely to remain in the labor force after marriage. What was true for women in general was also true of, er of the early graduates of what was then called the Women's College, the large majority of whom got married, raised families, and did not pursue careers. The fact that many women left work upon marriage reflected cultural norms, the nature of the work available to them, and legal strictures. The occupational choices of those young women who did work were severely circumscribed. Most women lacked significant education. Only 54% of girls aged 5 to 19 were enrolled in school in 1890. And Women with little education mostly toiled as peace workers in factories or as domestic workers, jobs that were dirty and often unsafe. Educated women, like those who attended Brown's Women College, were scarce. Fewer than 2% of all 18 to 24 year olds were enrolled in an institution of higher education, and just one third of those were women. Such women did not have to perform manual labor, but their choices were likewise constrained. Edna MacDonald was a graduate of the class of 1919. In, in her oral history, she summed up the opportunities for her and her classmates. Let's be frank, she said. What choices did women have? Teaching, you could teach. You could be a lab technician or you could go into office work and be a secretary. Those were the only real choices. Marjorie Chittenden Leonard graduated from Pembroke in 1929 and went on to earn a JD as the only woman in her class at Boston University after two others withdrew. And with that law degree, her first job was as a secretary and she continued to struggle to find work as a lawyer. In her oral history, Doris Madeline Hopkins, a 1928 graduate, talked about the opportunity that she had to work, but also about being told that she had to leave her job when she got married. Indeed, at the time, marriage bars were widespread. There were notable exceptions such as, of course, Mary Emma Woolley, a Brown graduate who went on to serve as the president of Mount Holyoke College, and Ethel Robinson, the first black woman to graduate from Brown, who taught English at Howard University. Helen Butts from the class of 1928 taught natural sciences at Smith and later zoology at Wellesley the beginning of a long and productive career as a biological research researcher. Another exception was Betty Stafford, the aunt of my husband George. She grew up in Providence, earned bachelor's and master's degrees at Brown in mathematics, and then rather adventurously headed west, teaching at two universities in Texas in the 1920s before completing her PhD and then teaching at the University of Wisconsin. Despite the widespread sentiment against women, particularly married women working outside the home, and with the limited opportunities available to them, women did enter the labor force in greater numbers over this period, with participation rates reaching nearly 50% for single women by 1930 and nearly 12% for married women. This rise suggests that while the incentive, and in many cases the imperative, remain for women to drop out of the labor force at marriage when they could rely on their husband's income, mores were changing. Indeed, these years overlapped with the so-called first wave of the women's movement, 
when women came together to agitate for change on a variety of social issues, including suffrage and temperance, and which culminated in the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, guaranteeing women the right to vote. Between the 1930s and mid-1970s, women's participation in the economy continued to rise, with the gains primarily owing to an increase in work among married women. By 1970, 50% of single women and 40% of married women were participating in the labor force. Several factors contributed to this rise. First, with the advent of mass high school education, graduation rates rose substantially. At the same time, new technologies contributed to an increased demand for clerical workers, and these jobs were increasingly taken on by women. Moreover, because these jobs tended to be cleaner and safer, the stigma attached to work for a married woman diminished. And while there were still marriage bars that forced women out of the labor force, these formal barriers were gradually removed over the period following World War II. Another innovation was the introduction in the late 1940s of part-time schedules, which combined with the proliferation of modern appliances to make it more feasible for married women to work outside the home. Over the decades from 1930 to 1970, increasing opportunities also arose for highly educated women, such as the graduates of what by then was called Pembroke College to work in professions. That said, early in that period, most women still expected to have short careers and women were still largely viewed as secondary earners whose husbands' careers came first. Thus, while it was becoming more common for women such as Betty Stafford to teach at colleges and universities, their career prospects were not the same as those for men. After earning her PhD at Wisconsin, Betty married a fellow student and over the next decade co-authored five important papers with him and a well-regarded reference work. But while her husband progressed from instructor to professor at Wisconsin, Betty worked as an instructor on an ad hoc basis. During World War II, while he worked for the government in Washington and New York, Betty stayed in Madison teaching math to servicemen. When he took a job teaching in California after the war, they divorced, and it was only then that she was given a position as an assistant professor. As time progressed, attitudes about women working in their employment prospects did change. As women gained experience in the labor force, they increasingly saw that they could balance work and family. A new model of the two-income family emerged. Some women began to attend college and graduate school with the ex expectation of working, whether or not they planned to marry and have families, as did Rita Schur Germain, an immigrant who survived Auschwitz, graduated from Pembroke in 1953, and went on to teach European history, while her husband also had a successful academic career. In her oral history, Rita says she was encouraged by many brown professors and never considered the possibility that her gender would stand in the way of an academic career a shift in outlook that was becoming increasingly common in the 1950s. As did most women's colleges at the time, Pembroke continued to produce nurses, school teachers, and social workers, and many women who worked only until they married and had children. But from the late 1950s on, it also increasingly graduated writers, doctors, lawyers, diplomats, physicians, psychotherapists and archaeologists. And in 1959, the first female faculty member of Brown University. Among those women fortunate to attend Pembroke in this era of dramatic change was me. I enrolled at Brown, fully planning to attend graduate school and have a career, as did many of my classmates in the class of 1967. 
By the 1970s, a dramatic change in women's work lives was underway. In the period after World War II, many women had not expected that they would spend as much of their adult lives working as turned out to be the case. By contrast, in the 1970s, young women were commonly ex expected that they would spend a substantial portion of their lives in the labor force, and they prepared for it, increasing their educational attainment and taking courses in college majors that better equipped them for careers as opposed to just jobs. In surveys of young people about their expectations of their futures, young women during this era increasingly placed an emphasis on career success. Susan Graber Slusky of the class of 1971 said in her oral history that she chose Pembroke for Brown's excellence in chemistry and physics because she was already planning the career she went on to have as a researcher. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this is also the period in which many all-male colleges admitted women or combined their women's and men's undergraduate schools, as did Brown when it merged Pembroke and Brown College in 1971. These changes in attitudes and expectations were supported by other changes underway in society. Workplace protections were enhanced through the passage of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act in 1978 and the recognition of sexual harassment in the workplace. Access to birth control increased, which allowed married couples greater control over the size of their families and young women the ability to delay marriage and to plan children around their educational and work choices. And in 1974, women gained for the first time the right to apply for credit in their own name without a male cosigner. <laughs> By the early 1990s, the labor force participation rate of prime working age women reached just over 74%, compared with roughly 83% for prime working age men. By then, the share of women going into the traditional fields of teaching, nursing, social work, and clerical work declined, and more women were becoming doctors, lawyers, managers, and yes, professors. As women increased their education and joined industries and occupations formerly dominated by men, the gap in earnings between women and men began to close significantly. Looking back, the story of the past 125 years is one of slow but steady progress toward women's full participation in the economy and fulfillment of their career goals. Unfortunately, the success of women has often been seen as coming at the expense of men. Indeed, Regularly in the late 19th and 20th centuries, there were calls to protect men from women's entry into the labor force. The early female graduates of Brown faced such attitudes from fellow students and even from faculty. Ruth Pedersen, a member of the class of 1919, said some professors did not want to teach women and prohibited women from taking their classes. Marjorie Leonard remembered one Boston University professor who urged her to drop out of law school. When she refused, this professor punished her by forcing her to recite the details of rape and seduction cases before her jeering, stomping classmates. And it wasn't only men who had this attitude. Among the women who were fighting for better labor standards early in the 20th century, many were heavily influenced by the elite cultural standards that viewed a woman's place as in the home and argued that men should be paid a family wage that would allow them to support their family single-handedly, a standard that many working class families could not afford. Moreover, many of the labor protections promoted to protect women were often based on theories about women's weaker nature, and these protections served to circumscribe their work. 
During the Great Depression, limiting women's role in the workforce was considered a way to address the high rates of unemployment. Although the experience of those years showed the importance of women in supporting their families financially. Similarly, women who had successfully worked during World War II, either as part of the war effort or to support their families while their husbands were fighting, often were pushed out of their jobs to make room for returning soldiers. After the war and then single, my relative, Betty Stafford, remained an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin despite an enviable body of research. She married another Wisconsin professor, an eminent chemist, and collaborated with him on, her, on his research. But in 1954, she gave up her assistant professorship, she said, to be able to accompany her husband on his frequent international travels. Betty later moved with her husband to California, and after his death, she, she endowed a graduate fellowship in the sciences and a prize in theoretical chemistry. Although Betty's accomplishments were considerable, against the backdrop of increasing opportunity for women over her lifetime, I believe that Betty Stafford Hirschfelder was denied opportunities and greater success simply because she was a woman. Despite the fears of some that women entering the workforce would crowd out men, the evidence shows that the rise in women's participation has contributed to widespread improvements in the safety and productivity of our workplaces, to the health of our families, and to the macroeconomic success that our country has enjoyed over the past 125 years. In the first decades of the 20th century, the struggle to improve the working conditions of young women drawn into factories was a pillar of the overall movement toward improved labor standards. Women's demands for safer factories, humane work weeks, and higher pay, which were often pursued through organizing and striking, contributed substantially to the social upheaval and public debate of that period that eventually led to the passage of stronger labor standards. These efforts also produced generations of women who went on to be leaders in the broader labor movement and in the broader movements for equality. The rise in female labor force participation was an early focus of and helped establish the fields of statistics and labor economics in their modern incarnations. Carol Wright, the first commissioner of what is now known as the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and who established the high standards for data collection and analysis for which the Bureau is known, devoted his agency's fourth annual report for the year 1888 to the topic of working women in large cities. Moreover, the issues surrounding women's work, such as the minimum wage, pay equity, and maximum work weeks were topics of great interest to early practitioners of labor economics. It's often said that we should welcome women's presence, presence in the workplace because it allows us to capitalize on the talents of our entire population, and this is certainly true, but it's also good business. A number of studies on how groups perform indicate that workforces that vary on dimensions such as gender, race, and ethnicity, produce better decision-making processes and better outcomes. Evidence also suggests that women's work has positive spillovers to their family lives and to the success of their children, which in turn benefits all of society. It's a well-established finding in the literature on development that maternal education and work are positively associated with better health and educational outcomes for children. A recent meta-study also suggests that children in the United States with working mothers do as well, if not better, in school, both academically and behaviorally, than children with mothers that stay home full time. This effect is particularly strong for families that have fewer social and economic resources, including single parent families. As time goes on, girls with working mothers 
are more likely to be employed and hold supervisory positions, and they earn somewhat more. In addition, sons raised in families with working mothers assume greater childcare responsibilities as adults than sons whose mothers did not work. This is not to say that children do not need attention from both parents to develop into academically successful and socially well-adjusted adults. They certainly do. Also, as I will discuss, women are making choices that reflect their desire to balance work and family. These findings bear on the question of how best to support women's work through public policies aimed at helping women and, better, and men better manage work and family. From a macroeconomic perspective, women's incorporation into the economy contributed importantly to the rapid rise in economic output and well-being over the 20th century. Between 1948 and 1990, the rise in female labor force participation contributed about a half percentage point per year to the potential growth rate of real gross domestic product. And this estimate does not take into account the effect of the increases in women's education and work experience that also occurred over that period and boosted their productivity. In addition, since 1979, women have accounted for a majority of the rise in real household income. In dollar terms, the gains were greatest for households in the top third of the earnings distribution. But without the increase in women's earnings, families in the bottom and middle third of the distribution would have experienced declines. I've argued that thus far, we as a country have reaped great benefits from the increasing role that women have played in the economy. But evidence suggests that barriers to women's continued progress remain. The participation rate for prime working age women peaked in the late 1990s and currently stands at about 75%. Of course, women, particularly those with lower levels of education, have been affected by the same economic forces that have been pushing down participation among men, including technical change and globalization. However, women's participation plateaued at a level well below that of prime working age men, which stands at over 88%. While some married women choose not to work, the size of this disparity should lead us to examine the extent to which structural problems, such as lack of equal opportunity and challenges to combining work and family, are holding back women's advancement. As I mentioned earlier, the gap in earnings between men and women has narrowed substantially, but progress has slowed lately, and women working full time still earn about 17% less than men on average each week. Even when we compare men and women in the same or similar occupations who appear nearly identical in background and experience, a gap of about 10% typically remains. We cannot therefore rule out that gender-related impediments hold back women, including outright discrimination, attitudes that reduce women's success in the workplace, and an absence of mentors. Recent research has shown that although women now enter professional schools in numbers nearly equal to men, they're still substantially less likely to reach the highest echelons of their professions. For instance, 47% of students at top 50 law schools are female, and women obtain 40% of MBAs from top programs. Nonetheless, women are still poorly represented among corporate CEOs as partners in top law firms and as executives in finance. Even in my own field of economics, women constitute only about one-third of PhD recipients a number that has barely budged in two decades. This lack of success in climbing the professional ladder would seem to explain why the wage gap actually remains largest for those at the top of the earnings distribution. One of the primary factors contributing to the failure of these highly skilled women 
to reach the tops of their professions and earn equal pay is that top jobs in fields such as law and business require longer work weeks and penalize taking time off. This would have a disproportionately large effect on women who continue to bear the lion's share of domestic and child rearing responsibilities. Within academia, the short time frame in which assistant professors have to prove themselves good candidates for tenure by publishing typically overlaps with the period in which many women contemplate starting a family, forcing difficult trade-offs. Employers may require the long hours and short absences for good reasons. For instance, the work may involve relationships with clients or accumulating a significant amount of knowledge about a deal or a case in a condensed period of time. If it's costly for employees to share information and split the work, then there would be a high premium in the form of compensation for those who can work the long hours. Workplaces where the income of employees depends on the effort of coworkers, such as law partnerships, also have an incentive to require long work weeks. But however sensible such arrangements may be from a business perspective, it can be difficult for women to meet the demands in these fields once they have children. The very fact that these types of jobs require such long hours likely discourages some women, as well as men, from pursuing these career tracks. Advances in technology have facilitated greater work sharing and flexibility in scheduling, and there are further opportunities in this direction. Economic models also suggest that while it can be difficult for any one employer to move to a model with shorter hours, if many firms were to change their model, they and their workers could all be better off. Of course, most women are not employed in fields that require such long hours or that impose such severe penalties for taking time off. But the difficulty of balancing work and family is a widespread problem. In fact, the recent trend in many occupations is to demand complete scheduling flexibility which can result in too few hours of work for those with family demands and can make it difficult to schedule childcare. Reforms that encourage companies to provide some predictability in schedules, cross-train workers to perform different tasks, or require a minimum guaranteed number of hours in exchange for flexibility could improve the lives of workers holding such jobs. Another problem is that that in most states, childcare is affordable for, fe for fewer than half of all families. In just 5% of workers with wages in the bottom quarter of the wage distribution have jobs that provide them with paid family leave. This circumstance puts many women in the position of having to choose between caring for a sick family member and keeping their jobs. In this context, it's useful to compare the workforce experiences of American women to those in other advanced economies. In 1990, the labor force participation rate in the United States of prime working age men, 74%, was higher than in all but a few industrialized nations. But in the intervening years, while the participation rate of US women was roughly stable, Elsewhere, it increased steadily, and by 2010, the United States fell to 17th place out of 22 advanced economies with respect to female labor force participation. A number of studies have examined the role of various public policies in explaining patterns in female labor force participation across countries. These studies find that policy differences in particular, the expansion of paid leave following childbirth, steps to improve the availability and affordability of childcare, and increased availability of part-time work go a long way toward explaining the divergence between advanced economies. Evidence suggests that if the United States had policies in place, such as those employed in many European countries, female labor force participation could be as high as 82%. Of course, these policies entail trade-offs. 
Women in other advanced countries are more likely than women in the United States to be employed part-time, which could reflect a greater ease in arranging flexible schedules and more time with family, but it also comes with costs, including a wage penalty and fewer opportunities for training and advancement. Such findings raise the question of whether the policies enacted overseas in recent years have had the unintended consequence of making it more expensive for employees, employers to hire women into full-time jobs with opportunities for advancement as women are more likely to be eligible for and make use of such benefits. This possibility should inform our own thinking about policies to make it easier for women and men to combine their family and career aspirations. For instance, improving access to affordable and good quality childcare would appear to fit the bill as it's been shown to support full-time employment. Recently, there also seems to be some momentum for providing families with paid leave at the time of childbirth. The experience in Europe suggests picking policies that do not narrowly target childbirth, but instead can be used to meet a variety of health and caregiving responsibilities. The United States faces a number of longer term economic challenges, including the aging of the population and the low growth rate of productivity. One recent study estimates that increasing the female participation rate to that of men would raise our GDP by 5%. And as I've argued, our workplaces and families as well as women themselves would benefit from continuing progress. However, a number of other factors which I've only had a chance to touch upon appear to be holding women back, including the difficulty women currently have in trying to combine their careers with other aspects of their lives, including caregiving. In looking to solutions, we should consider improvements to work environments and policies that benefit not only women, but all workers. Pursuing such a strategy would be in keeping with the story of the rise in women's involvement in the workforce, which as I've described here, has contributed not only to their own well-being, but more broadly to the welfare and prosperity of our country. I titled my remarks today, So We Can All Succeed. This title was inspired by Malala Yousafzai, the advocate for girls and women's education who said, we cannot all succeed when half of us are held back. Brown University has played its own role by admitting women 125 years ago, by educating many thousands of women over the decades, and by continuing to be a place that equips men and women with the means to make our nation and the world a better place. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Yellen, for your thoughtful and inspiring remarks. And now I have a very special presentation to make. The President's Medal is the highest honor that a Brown President may bestow. Uh, and it honors a person who's achieved distinction in a particular field, including education, scholarship, public service, the arts, or philanthropy. And it's a distinction that has been awarded over time to only a very select few. And today, I am honored on behalf of Brown University to add Dr. Janet Yellen to this list. the commendation. <laughs> For your wise advancement and application of knowledge of markets, policy making, and economic behavior to the public good, and for the way you have in your life and work reflected the shared values of Brown University, the collaboration we encourage, the intellectual curiosity we foster, and the impact we aspire to through our service. I'm delighted to bestow on you the Presidential Medal. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks. Thank you.